Hello, my name is Anton Strugarek, and I would like first to thank the European Astronomical Society for awarding me the Merak Prize of 2021 for the best early career in theoretical astrophysics. I'm going to present you today some work I did on the magnetism in stellar systems with this colleague cited here. I will focus first on the dynamo action inside stars and how we can sustain or not a cycle. Then we will move to the environment of the star and how magnetism sculpts the corona and the wind of a star and affects stellar evolution. And finally, how it can lead to very interesting and intriguing star planet magnetic interactions. So first, when you speak about magnetism, you can look at the sun and think about it uh, for, for, for a bit. So the sun is a, a ball of about 700 megameters, and it has a, a dipolar field, a large scale field of about four gauss at its surface, okay? But you have much more strong fields on the sun uh, in the form of sunspots and active regions above, where you can reach fields of a, almost a, a Tesla strength. And then you can think about the heliosphere that is structured by this magnetic field that is very, very large. And at the Earth, for instance, we measure fields of about six nanoteslas. Oh, sorry, that was a movie. Next, you can think about what you know about uh, stars. And we start to have strong constraints on, on the magnetism of stars. This is a plot made by Victor C in 2019, where he compiled many different observations using Zeeman, um, Zeeman imaging, Zeeman Doppler imaging, for instance. And you see here that you, you can constrain the strengths, the surface field strengths of stars as a function of the Rosby number. The Rosby number is a measure of how much rotation influences the interior of a, of a star. You see the sun is at the bottom low end here of the plot in magenta. And you see that at some low Rosby numbers of so, uh, fastly rotating stars, you see some saturation in the field strengths. And typically we observe fields that vary between a few gauss to uh, a, a percent of the Tesla for the large scale field here. This is of course reminiscent of what we observe also in X-ray luminosity here divided by the bolometric luminosity of the star, where when you plot it as a function of the Rosby number, you see the same kind of decreasing trends with Rosby number and the saturated parts on, uh, with at very low uh, Rosby numbers. Now, when you, in, when you think about magnetism, you also uh, naturally think about variability in time. And of course, most of you know about the famous 11 year solar, solar cycle that is represented here as a butterfly diagram. You see the shapes of butterfly wings, which trace the location where spots appear at the surface of our sun. And as the cycle progresses, progresses this uh, appearance moves towards the equator. Then they, you have no spots almost and the next cycle occur. Uh, this is on average an 11 year magnetic cycle, but it can vary of plus of two minus, uh, plus, of, uh, plus or minus two years typically. Then this, this uh, cyclic uh, activity has a strong influence on how the heliosphere is structured. And this is something we see typically in measurements of the solar wind. And this is what is shown here with Ulysses data. You see on the left, the solar mini during solar minimum, you have very fast wind at high helio latitude, typically of about six to 700 kilometers per second. And close to the equatorial plane here, close to the ecliptic plane, you see a mixture uh, of uh, fast and slow uh, winds. Then on the right, during solar maximum, the magnetic topology of the sun is more complex. And you see a mixture of these different types of winds at all uh, helio latitudes. So this is for the context. And I want now to first dive into dynamo action of, and cycles in solar type stars. So when you think about that, the first thing to, to, to question yourself is where does the energy come from? So inside a, a star, you have two main sources of energy, internal and potential energy but you cannot transfer any of this energy directly into magnetic energy. You have to go through kinetic energy, either through the work of buoyancy force or pressure work, or pressure force work. And that triggers motions, typically large scale motions, such as differential rotation, marine circulation, and more small scale motions, such as convection, of course. Then through the work of the Lorentz force, you can, uh, you can have magnetic energy that is uh, created. And then you can have different types of magnetic uh, structures, such as la the large scale dipole I've been speaking about before, but also magnetic rebounds, flux tubes, and et cetera, that we observe in stellar atmospheres. Then part of this energy can also dissipate back into the internal energy through ohmic heating. Now with some colleagues, we did a very large uh, study uh, of uh, dynamo action in, in solar light stars. Uh, it's a numerical study, 3D. You see a visualization of one of these models here. And we have tried to assess how much power is actually diverted into sustaining magnetism. 
And we can classify these into three categories, slow rotators, solar-like rot rotators, and fast rotators. And typically, if I want just to give you a rough estimate, you can get for slow rotators up to 0.01% uh, of the stellar luminosity that is diverted into sustaining uh, magnetism. For solar-like rotators, it's between 0.1 and 3%. And for fast rotator, we see some hint of saturation up to about a percent of the stellar luminosity. And note that even for slow rotators, it's still a very large power, actually. And so even slow rotators or small stars can harbor strong fields because the dynamo action is able to actually uh, be quite efficient. Now, this is for the overall energy content inside a, a solar-like star. But of course, we want one thing we want to understand in the origin uh, of, solar cycle, of the cycle in the sun. And this has been a great debate in the modelers community uh, because many, many people have tried to do more or less complex uh, models uh, trying to reproduce or, do, or not reproduce uh, solar-like cycles. So this is just a collage of many different uh, codes and techniques and, and teams that have tried actually to, to do that. And uh, up to, uh, I, I would argue, up to six years ago, it was quite a mess and we had a lot of different solutions. Uh, so. Uh, Given this, with some colleagues in Montreal, in, in the US and in France, we tried to actually address a minimal, <clears throat> develop a minimal setup to reproduce a solar-like cycle. So this is what I would call a prototype cyclic dynamo for a solar-like star. So this is, I've taken off a, an octant of the simulation and you see the structuring of the field inside the simulation, which is a, a, a blue ribbon in the middle. And outside, I've just extrapolated the magnetic field. The movie just jumped in time, and you see that the internal ribbon starts to be distorted and reversed, and actually change its orientation. And then later on, it will just switch color and become red. And then we have a, an inversion of the overall polarity of the system. And in the new thing that we found that, that was published in 2017 is that here the main mechanism behind the existence of a magnetic cycle is a feedback between the field that is sustained through dynamo action and the, the mean, the large scale flow, which is a differential rotation here, that actually um, uh, is modulated uh, along the cycle. So you have a, like a pre system almost, where you have, a, uh, you have a, an oscillation between the two energies that leads to a cyclic behavior. So this was done in a, in a, thing, a quite a large study with different simulation, but only with one code. And we have reproduced this study actually more recently. With, uh, with yet a, a different technique. And we start to have a, a, a good paving of a good understanding on what occurs again as a function of this Rosby number that I was mentioning in my introduction. Here, I want you to focus only on the colors. You see that at low Rosby number, we have mainly blue uh, symbols, which means that we observe in those models small short cycles of about a year period. Okay, We see some hints of such cycle in the sun, but it's not the dominant one. At intermediate Rosby number, which would be the solar-like regime, we do see red symbols where we have long decadal cycles that resemble a lot the solar cycle. And then when you go to high Rosby number, above one typically here in these units, you see the symbols become black because we lose completely magnetic cycles. I must insist here, it's not that we lose magnetism. We still have very strong magnetic field and large scale fields. It's just that they do not uh, oscillate anymore in time. So now this is mainly a theoretical uh, exploration. So you can ask also uh, what, what is really the relationship with the solar cycle. And the big thing that we found in this simulation in that actually they agree quite well with the uh, solar cycle values. So this is a representation here of the, uh, the ratio of the cycle period to the rotation period of, of, the, of uh, the model and of stars in the vertical axis against some measure of the Rosby number by means of the luminosity of the star and its rotation period. And you see that the numerical simulation in blue actually agreed quite well with the magenta symbol for the sun in the middle of the plot here. The other symbols in cyan are, uh, are observation for distant stars. Some of them that, arbor, that exhibit uh, multiple cycli cyclicalities. As you can see, that these are the, linked, uh, the stars linked with the dash, vertical dashed line. And you see that for the solar twins, we actually have a low that is quite good in good agreement with what you observe also for distant stars. So we think that we may have found a, a new dynamo mechanism that was overlooked in the past, that was considered but overlooked, that could be reconciling what we observe for the solar cycle and for stellar magnetic cycles as well. Now, if you want, of course, to so have more detail, uh, you have, I have listed the papers and you can, you, we can have a discussion during the question, of course. 
Now I want to, do, to go to the second part of my talk uh, and talk to you very quickly on modeling efforts we have been doing in my group in Paris, where we try to model the environment of the sun and of solar light star. This is the wind predict modeling team that is led by myself, Sacha Brun and Victor Reville in France. And it's, and it's a modeling framework that is uh, developed over the open source code uh, Pluto. And in this, with this model, we have done uh, many different things. I will not list everything that is listed here. But for instance, we can do models of the, of the solar wind and compare with observation in UV and white light to see that actually we're doing quite a, a good job at reproducing the structuring of the solar, of the solar environment. We can do propagation of CMEs. We have been, we have been doing many different comparisons to, to make sure that our model is robust. And last but not least, we also have uh, used that, uh, applied this model to distant stars to uh, study uh, star planet magnetic interaction. And this is gonna be the, next, the last part of the talk. I want to give some highlight here to a new development of this model that, that, that is very uh, interesting and promising, where we have managed to couple a simplified dynamo model to a, a, a wind model, to a coronal, coronal model. So this is a movie on the left, upper left, you will see a, a zoom on the surface of the star, which is a, a white dashed line. And on the right, you will see the full numerical domain that expands up to uh, 20 solar radii here. And on the bottom, you will see the butterfly diagram of the model. So you see that we have inside this, the star here, a dynamo model that is running and the magnetic structure actually propagates and inverts the corona of the, of the model star. And you see that you can start to also take into account the feedback of this corona onto the dynamo action itself through the leak of magnetic helicity, for instance. So this is a, a very new uh, endeavor that we have taken up with my former student, Barbara Perry, and uh, which is very promising for many different applications. And finally, I want to mention here also solar orbiter. As I was saying, we can do a pretty detailed modeling of the solar environment, and we have been doing systematic models of the uh, heliosphere at different epochs of solar orbiter. This is for its first, uh, the first perihelion of solar orbiter, for instance, when you see the prediction of the model on top of which we have put the position of the planets, the Earth, and of solar orbiter at that time. So in, in what remains, it, what remains uh, it, what in, in the time that remains, I want now to, to switch topic a bit and go into star planet magnetic interactions. So we've seen how star sustains their magnetism inside, inside, uh, inside, how this structures the environment. And now we can have planets that actually orbit inside this structured environment. So if you look at the population of exoplanets as we know it today, you may be, get confused by this plot because I like to represent it in a slightly different way. The vertical axis is here is the stellar mass uh, normalized to the Earth's mass, to the solar mass, okay? And the horizontal axis is the orbital distance. Usually you see it in un astronomical units, but here, here I have normalized it to the stellar radius so that you see really the compacity of most of the system that we know of. You see the line at, at, at 10 uh, stellar, stellar radii here. So th those are very, very close planets to their host. If you try to define a, a hot population that would be typically What's, what's found in the, in the literature, uh, planets below an orbital period of 10 days, this is about 40% of the, on, of the uh, sample here. What's very interesting for this, uh, inter for this uh, population of exoplanets that we have detected is that they actually are likely in a very different interaction regime with the star compared to what we have typically in the solar system. And the reason for that is that if you, if you take, for instance, a cool star, such as the sun or a smaller mass uh, star, that has an outer convective envelope, such a star will, will, will um, have a hot corona that will lead to the existence of an accelerating wind uh, as you get uh, far, further and further from your star. This kind of accelerating wing at some point will cross what we call the alven radius or surface, which is the local alvenic speed and become super alvenic. For the sun, we think that this separation is between maybe eight to 20 uh, solar radii, so very close. So of course, all the, the planets in the, in the solar system are outside of this alvenic uh, radius and are in a super alvenic interaction. But for all these very close in exoplanets that we know of, they're actually likely to be in orbiting inside this, uh, this uh, surface and to be magnetically connected directly to the host. That can lead to very different, uh, di very different um, interactions that I will detail in a minute, but can lead to observable feature in, this, uh, in the stellar environment. 
Of course, this kind of, uh, of a system actually bears some resemblance to well, some other systems that we know in the solar system this time, which would be the interaction between the magnetosphere of Jupiter with its uh, satellites. And you, you may, most of you uh, surely know this picture of the oral, oral uh, oval at, uh, at Jupiter, when you see actually emissions uh, that are the, um, uh, that are related to the existence of these uh, satellites, and you see the footprint of an in magnetic interaction between those satellites and the uh, the uh, the pole of uh, Jupiter here. So you see here the footprint of Io, here of Ganymede, and here of, of uh, Europa. So we think that we should be able to detect such case things, but now you translate that into a planet orbiting a star. So if you try to do a simple model, uh, uh, a, sum, a rule of the sum to see how many of these planets actually are likely to be in this interaction regime. This is this line here that I've shown in, in, in red and half of these hot exoplanets are actually likely to, uh, to be uh, in this interaction. So this is about 20% of, uh, of the total sample, which is still a, a large number of planets to study. Now, as I was saying, there are many different interaction, uh, types of, inter of uh, interactions that can be triggered due to this proximity of the planet to its own star. You can have a shock now this time in front of the planet due to the orbital motion and not in between the two as we have typically for the for solar system planets. You can have some much, you can have some energy channeled toward the star that lead to uh, to emissions that, that can affect stellar activity uh, uh, tracers. They can be also maybe detected in radio. Uh, you can also have a, a, a net torque that applies to the planet and make it migrate. You can eat the planet if it doesn't have a magnetic field, and then have some emissions if it has a magnetosphere. And you can also uh, modulate atmospheric escape. So now I want to talk to, about very quickly on energy channel. How much energy can we expect for that? So what I did in the past that was published in 2015 is try to model that in 3D. So I have put, I have my wind predict model of the of an environment of a star. If it, here it's for an idealized uh, magnetosphere of a star. And I put a planet inside of it. And you see that as I launch the simulation, you reach a steady state. And here I represent a current system that establishes between the planet and the star. Okay, I will just cut out here to see the structure. The positive is in red and negative is in blue. And along this uh, structure that are above and uh, below the equatorial plane here, you have many Alvin waves that propagate in between the two bodies and that carry a lot of energy that can be ultimately deposited somewhere in the, uh, in the stellar atmosphere. I have carried uh, a large uh, amount of uh, this kind of simulation varying the parameters and the topologies. And what I can say is that you can channel easily, well, or at maximum, let's say you can channel at maximum a power of 10 to the 19 watts, which is significant here. And you can also have magnetic torques that affect the migration of a closing planet on a, on a time scale of typically 100 million years, which is significant, of course, over secular time scale evolutions. We have tried to apply this kind of ideas to real systems. And I want just to highlight one study we did with some colleagues in Toulouse on Kepler 78. So Kepler 78, it's interesting because we do have some observations for the mind Doppler imaging of the magnetic topology of the star here uh, for July 2015. And at that time, there were also uh, uh, some modulation in some activity tracers of the star in H alpha, in the HNK band of calcium 2, and in the infrared triplet also. And we were wondering if this was mainly due to magnetic activity modulation of the star as it rotates. OK, thank you, Lucio. Or if it could also originate from some kind of star planet interaction. So we did the modeling of the wind of the, of this, of this star. This is what is represented here. And the red circle here is actually the orbit of the planet. So it's one of the shortest orbit planet we know of. It's very, very close to its star. And I have highlighted in color the magnetic field connected, connecting the orbit of the planet to the surface of the star here. So if you try to put yourself in the position of an observer here, you can see that you will have footprints of the interaction that will move around the, uh, the, the star as the planet orbits. But you will also have the star that rotates that will uh, show you a different uh, part of the interaction. So this is just a little animation showing you that as the planet orbit around the star, your foot point will just circulate over a, a given path that can be more or less cons constrained through observations and combination of observation and models. And you can try to produce a, a synthetic observation from that synthetic uh, emission from that. 
And this is uh, uh, the game we play here. And you see that uh, the observation again on, are in red. And you see that the average uh, synthetic observation is in black. And here, of course, we are a bit disappointed because it's a negative uh, result here. We see that the, the modulation we were seeing on Kepler 78 at that time cannot be explained by magnetic interactions. But this could be well the case for other systems. Uh, and thanks to this technique, we can actually have a quantitative estimate to rule in or out this kind of uh, physical origin for the magnetic act some modulation of the magnetic activity of stars. And in the few minutes I have remaining, I want to talk quickly about planet migration. And this is now taking more on the large scale and on the population of exoplanets and to uh, think whether or not those interactions could affect the stellar population, the, the planet, exoplanet population as we know it today. So back in 2017, with some colleagues, we tried to assess systematically for different systems, what were the key players for making a planet migrate uh, along uh, evolution once the system is in the main sequence. And we compared it to the main key player, so the other key player here, which is typically tidal interactions that are invoked to, uh, to explain uh, uh, migration after the disk has dissipated and the system is in the main sequence. What we found is that tidal torques are expected to dominate for typically G-type stars with hot Jupiters. So for those systems, magnetic interaction just add noise to the, to the, to the story. But magnetic torques actually are likely to dominate for M dwarfs with Earth's mass planets. So this is interesting. And for young systems, what we find is that we need a case by case discussion because depending on, on the true magnetic, uh, magnetic field strength of the star, it can vary. Next, what we have done uh, with my, again, some colleagues and some PhD students in my team is to develop the SPEM code where we have folded in, folded in some parametrization of these talks and try to, to couple that to stellar evolution grids to assess how we expect uh, those talks to play in a dynamical way over secular evolution. So this is an example of the evolution of a planet as a function of age. This is this semi-major axis. So if you start a planet below the co-rotation radius, which, which is this black line here, the planet will migrate inward up where it's uh, fill its roach lobe and then it gets destroyed. If you start at, outside of the initial co-rotation radius here, the planet will migrate outward until it crosses the co-rotation radius again. This, this change in co-rotation radius is here because the star is spinning down, okay? And then after it has crossed that, due to magnetic interaction, it will uh, migrate inward again. So this is just one example. We have done many of them, and we have tried to assess a synthetic population out of it, taking into account as many bias as we can. And uh, we've compared that systematically to what is observed in the um, Kepler field uh, uh, from Macmillan et al. 2013, where they published a population as a function of the rotation period of the star and the orbital period of the planet. And what we find, we have varied the, the physical ingredients in our model, and we, here we show uh, three different uh, populations in red, cyan, and dark blue. And the, the, the gray area here is the um, observed population. And you see that at above typically a few days period, all the population mainly agree. There are, it's a flat population here because the interaction are not playing a major, major role here. But below that, where we have really a dearth of, uh, of planets in the observations, you see that if you only include tides, you have the, the green dissipation, the, grid, grid, uh, the red, sorry, uh, distribution. And if you include magnetic interactions and assume a given field, uh, magnetic field for your planet, you can start to deplete this region by just making your planet migrate and get destroyed uh, as it fills uh, as it fills its uh, roach lobe. So still, we have still some uh, physical ingredients probably here missing to explain the, the gap we have, but at least taking into account magnetic interactions changes the population significantly here uh, for short period uh, planets. Also, there may be an additional effect due to initial conditions that we have not explored yet that we can discuss in the discussion session if you want. So I'd like not to finish with a summary of all I said, because I, 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 I appreciate that it's been a lot of topics, but I want to just give some take home questions in these topics that I think are really important for the future. For magnetic cycles, for the sun and the star, we think we start to understand their origin, but yet there are still many things that puzzle us. We have stars that possess different types of cycles. Where does this uh, come from exactly? And how is it robust? Can we understand it from a theoretical point of view? 
can slowly magnetic rotating star produce magnetic cycle in the models we tend to say no but we have not many observations of this star because they're hard to, uh, to detect actually and finally this is a very important question are spots a mere manifestation of the dynamo itself or is it an active player we don't need it in the model we don't need them in the model to make a solar like cycle but the question can still be raised based on what we observe for the sun we know also that stellar magnetism controls the rotational evolution of solar like stars so how does this magnetism change during that evolution we have some ideas but many many blurry points and also very important how does the heating of the corona for solar like stars change at, uh, at the same time because this all depends ultimately on the content of magnetic energy in the star and finally the magnetic of magnetic field of exoplanet is unknown and it's a missing link between the magnetic field of stars we can observe and the magnetic field uh, we, of planets that we know of in the solar system so can we detect them we start to have some uh, very promising observation in various wavelengths that have been published over the past five years i would argue and can what can we do in on, on the theoretical side for hot exoplanets that are likely to have a uh, peculiar internal structure and all or certainly harboring very uh, specific types of uh, dynamics so i will leave you with those questions uh, and thank you for uh, your attention Thank you very much. I think we can now have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so actually the first one that I see is uh, not a, a question, but a congratulation to the prize winners from that Afikut Vikas. So, so far there, I see no other questions. People should feel free to ask them through the Q&A and the plenary channel on Slack. I. If, if nobody has a question, I have actually one question. <laughs> um, so I, it was a very, very great talk, very interesting. I, I was curious to, to ask you just in general. I mean, since uh, we know that even in the solar system, understanding the magnetic field of uh, gas giants and ice giants is not trivial. I mean, there's still a lot of open questions in the modeling and, and in understanding really how to, to measure even the strength of the, of the fields themselves. Uh, what, what is your your view about you know how far we can get in understanding the magnetic fields of the hot uh, massive planets in uh, in uh, exoplanets populations yeah, in the next ten years. Absolutely, that, that's a, that's a fantastic question, and of course, it is a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think that we are a bit lucky here uh, because, for instance, when you think about um, the tracers we have in mind to that are linked to the existence of magnetism or for hot exoplanets they could give you an indirect uh, measurements. Uh, okay, so if either it's, uh, for instance, radio emissions that are would be linked to the, the kind of things we see in the Jupiter IO system, but there it's very indirect. Uh, so you, you have many different aspects folded in, and so you could certainly fit different uh, aspects, uh, different uh, values for your magnetic field of the, of the planet. There are other uh, techniques that could be promising. If you are able to observe a shock, uh, a bow shock in front of the orbital motion, it will give you a size. Uh, and then your, uh, plan your planet with its magnetosphere becomes a probe of the environment. And you can try to assess based on what we know about the stellar wind theory. You can assess what is the magnetic field that is required to have this, uh, this side oh. of the obstacle. And this is a very, very promising uh, uh, aspect, I think, because it has not so many uh, unknown knobs that you can turn into fit the observations. So I would argue that there, there, there is a, a sweet spot uh, there in, in uh, as an indirect measurement of the field. There is nothing magnetic, magnetic here, but it comes from the existence of a magnetosphere and the size of magnetosphere. So I think this is uh, extremely promising. Yeah. Very interesting. Very nice. I, I think we we should show at this point the Merak certificate uh, for Antoine's prize. I'd so like to mark sharing if you want. Sure, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, here it is. So congratulations again uh, for thank you very much the theoretical astrophysics prize. It, it, will be, it will be sent to you, and you will be invited for the president's reception with the other Merak Prize winners next year. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks a lot. Then before we move to the next speaker, I saw that. Uh, Jean-Marie Lusier also joined uh, the Zoom uh, link. Uh, Jean-Marie is also uh, from the Merak board. So thanks a lot, Jean-Marie, for joining. Thank you, uh, Lucio. And then uh, I'm uh, very happy to move to the next 
prize recipient uh, with Professor Judith Shulaji from uh, ETA Zurich. And uh, Judith receives the prize uh, for new technologies, which includes also computational methods. She is a computational astrophysicist. And she receives the prize for her fundamental contribution to the study of circumplanetary disks in planet formation and the origin of the moons uh, of giant planets. And we are very happy to show her certificate as well. There it is. Okay, so then I leave the stage uh, to Judith. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lucio. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will just start my sharing my screen. So my name is Judith Sulaidi. Um, and first I would like to sincerely thank the EAS, the Merak Foundation, the selection committee, the nominators for this wonderful prize. And also I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to uh, talk about disks around planets uh, or in general planet formation. And one way to study this process is of course using computer simulations. And this is what I'm going to talk about in more details today. So here it is an example of such a planet formation simulation of ours. Planets are forming in gas uh, uh, dust disks around young stars. And this is what you see over here. This is the circumstellar disk, so the disk around on the star. And here we have a planet that is uh, currently forming. And as we zoom closer to the planet vicinity, we see the forming planet as this ball over here. And we see a structure around the planet uh, like butterfly wings. This is the so-called circumplanetary disk, so the disk around the planet, where the moons will form later on. Uh, around this planet. So these simulations uh, in my group are done uh, with the Jupiter code. This was originally developed by Frederick Massey. Then in 2015, I took over and put in radiative transfer so that we can have also information about the temperature, not just the density structure. And this way, for example, uh, providing more um, uh, correct uh, observation of predictions on how to observe these uh, forming planets and also to understand more the physics, how the accretion is influenced by various thermodynamical processes. So the definition of the circumplanetary disk could be the following. Um, I define it as a gaseous disk around the planet, which formed within the planet formation process, as opposed to Brandwart disk or circumstellar disks, which are formed uh, via the star formation process. These circumplanetary disks are different in comparison to circumstellar disk because the circumplanetary disk can be found within the large disk. So it's a disk within another disk and it's constantly fed by the larger disk. So it's, its mass is not uh, a, a closed reservoir of, of mass, but it's constantly getting fed by the larger disk. And that's going to also affect its, its uh, characteristics very much so. Now, I also would like, to, I, I like to distinguish the gaseous circumplanetary disk from circumplanetary debris disk, in which case we have um, building blocks of planets that remains orbiting around the planet, say debris. Um, that can be an evolved stage of this gaseous circumplanetary disk, but it can form also via other processes. For example, uh, if there is a planet-planet collision, the ejecta could form a debris disk around the planet. In that case, the circumplanetary debris disk form in a very different process than what I described in the first definition and what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk. So um, how does circumplanetary disks form? So first of all, every planet, you know, they have a solid core and they're starting to accrete gas around it. And there's more and more ga uh, gas um, in terms of atmosphere, or we can also say it's more correct term to say gaseous envelope, which is getting bigger and bigger as the planet is growing. And the envelope uh, uh, gets um, larger in mass, but also it's cooling in the same time. And once we have the right condition, once the envelope is, is, is uh, massive enough and it's cold 
enough in the environment, the envelope can collapse into a circumplanetary disk. So every planet is starting off with a circumplanetary envelope, but some of them grow that big or uh, are in a colder part of the, of the circumstellar disk where the circumplanetary envelope can collapse into a disk. And why we care about this? because only the disk forming planets can make moons around them. The envelope forming planets will only form their uh, primordial atmosphere or gaseous envelope, and they're never going to have moons or almost never. And this is what I'm going to talk about in, in the next slide, just in a second. So this, whether a planet forms a disk or an envelope, it depends mainly on two things, whether its mass is large enough. So the larger is the planetary mass, the more likely we have this envelope to disk transition happening. But it also depends on the temperature or more physically co correctly, the cooling time uh, in, the, in the area. But we can say, say temperature. If the, the, the temperature is cold enough in the environment, the envelope is more likely going to collapse uh, into a disk. But even a Jupiter mass planet, not necessarily always have a disk. If, the, if a Jupiter mass planet can be found too close to its star, it's never going to form a disk and therefore it's never going to have satellites. So that's why this, this problem is at least two dimensional. It's not only depending on the planetary mass, but also the cooling rates, the temperatures. So I said that almost uh, it, it was true what I said that uh, which planet can form or can have moons and which cannot have, but actually there are multiple ways to have moons. The circumplanetary disk formation case is the most robust one. This happens the most frequently. But there are also other ways to, to have a moon, because immediately you would say that, uh, OK, what about Earth's moon? Earth was always too small in mass and too close to the star that it only formed a circumplanetary envelope. It, never, it, it could not form a gaseous circumplanetary disk. But what happened to the young Earth is that it got hit by a Mars-sized uh, planet. And the planet-planet collision res resulted in ejecta, which formed a debris disk around the planet, and that formed the moon. But if this collision wouldn't have happened uh, for Earth, or if the collision would have been smaller, or just things wouldn't be um, you know, lucky for us, we wouldn't have a moon, because it never formed, the Earth never formed a gaseous circumplanetary disk. One other way to have a moon is to capture it. For example, it uh, is hypothesized that um, the two moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, might be uh, captured asteroid path objects. And definitely Triton, the biggest moon of Neptune, is an up, uh, captured Kuiper belt object. So that also can happen. But the most uh, robust case is uh, forming moons within the circumplanetary disk. And so this is the reason why, because the circumplanetary disk formation can only happen around massive planets and in the outer parts of the planetary systems. This is the reason why we find most of the moons in the outer planetary systems, not just in the solar system, but we can uh, we can probably say the same uh, for other uh, exoplanetary systems as well. However, there is only so far uh, one uh, exomoon candidate so far. So, but we pro we know that probably there are moons around exoplanets as well, and they're going to be uh, placed probably very far away from from their star. This is the reason why moons can be found in the outer planetary systems. So back to the circumplanetary disk, why it is important to study the circumplanetary envelopes or disks. First of all, they channel material to the forming planet and therefore determine the planet formation timescale, how big the planet can grow. And also, as I mentioned uh, before, this is the bird nest for moons to grow. So everything regarding moon formation, it's also determining. Now, the circumplanetary disk composition will influence the formation, uh, the composition of the planets and the moons that form within. So, for example, if we uh, consider exoplanet atmosphere um, observations, um, you know, the atmospheres of exoplanets, at least the primordial uh, atmospheres of exoplanets, are formed from this circumplanetary material. So in order to understand uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets, studying the circumplanetary material is important since this is what is going to be turned into a planet uh, uh, envelope, gaseous envelope, and, and also it turns into the moons as well. And the final point is because the circumplanetary uh, material is surrounding the forming planet, it influences the observability of forming planets. In fact, unfortunately, it hides it 
hides the forming planet from our view, as you see it over here. The planet is down here, and we see that even above the planet, there is significant uh, and, um, atmosphere um, of the circumplanetary disk. So no matter which direction we would try to observe this, uh, this planet, we wouldn't be able to see down to the planet. We can only detect the circumplanetary disk, not forming planets directly. And that's something uh, we should uh, consider in terms of observation when we plan uh, forming planet observations. So uh, the circumplanetary disk is constantly fed from the circumstellar disk. And I would like to show you how this uh, feeding is going on, because this is also how planets are operating their material. This is called the meridional circulation, and I schematized here on a, a simplistic 2D plot. What basically happens is that the spiral vix of the planets will uh, stir up the circumstellar disk material will bring up gas to the surface and also bring in gas into the uh, gap of the planet. And then some of these gas will uh, fall onto the circumplanetary disk and onto the planet directly as well. Now, not everything which falls onto the planet is going to be straight away accreted by the planet. Uh, I used to say that planets are not black holes. They don't have 100% accretion efficiency. They have very low, like less than 10% accretion efficiency. Actually, more than 90% of the gas which falls onto the planet vicinity will be channeled back uh, to the circumplanetary disk and from there to the circumstellar disk and arising up again to maintain this vertical circulation. And uh, what we found for uh, giant planets in 2014 has been also found for terrestrial planets by uh, or Chris Ormel and uh, colleagues in 2015. In the case of terrestrial planets, this uh, circulation is called atmospheric recycling. But it's the same thing. Planets, no matter of their mass, they operate from the vertical direction, and there is an outflow in the midplane. And this is kind of very much the opposite view than what people imagined in 20, 30 years ago. People thought that oh, the, the planets are operating their material from the midplane, but actually it's, it's not the case. And what's really cool that this uh, meridional circulation ha has been now observed with ALMA. Uh, is, there was a paper by Richard Tig and colleagues in Nature in 2019 uh, uh, for the observational evidence of this accretion uh, flow of uh, forming planets. So now we know that it's not only happening in our simulations, but it's also happening in real nature that planets accrete from their polar regions and they have an outflow in the midplane as well. Now I would like to show you this 3D circulation with the help of gas streamlines. So to show you how exactly this circulation happens in 3D, here is the planet region. The gas is coming in and going to encounter the shock front of the spiral wake of the planet. Therefore, some of them losing angular momentum or in other words, losing velocity. And there, uh, therefore, they can be accreted onto the circumplanetary disk. And that part of the gas, which could not be accreted right away, going to spiral outward inside the circumplanetary disk. So the circumplanetary disk is a decreation disk. And the gas is going back by the spiral wakes back to the circumstellar disk. So this uh, planetary accretion is really a three-dimensional process. And this is why we need to uh, run 3D hydrodynamical simulations uh, of this process in order to catch all these different uh, flows, especially vertically. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that I also use radiative transfer in this uh, code to determine temperature. So what did we learn about the temperatures uh, in the forming planet vicinity? Here, the colors are representing uh, the temperature scale in Kelvin in logarithmic scale. The peak of the scale is 16,000 Kelvin, which can be found if it in the planet. And you can see that the circumplanetary disk pops up with, uh, with brown color, so high temperatures in comparison to the background circumstellar disk. So what we learn is circumplanetary disks are hot. Why they are hot? Because of the accretion process, especially adiabatic compression for the gas heats up the, this gas, but also there is shock heating and viscous heating due to viscous shear as well. One other feature that you uh, see over uh, on this plot is that there is a shock front that is created by the infalling accretion uh, material. 
uh, accretion infall. Uh, and this is what it shows up with dark brown color. So high temperatures, roughly 10,000 Kelvin in this case. And I color coded um, the streamlines with the velocity. The high velocities are green, the low velocities are purple. And you can see uh, that as the gas passing to the shock front, it loses angular momentum, so losing velocity. And this is why uh, this gas could be accreted onto the planet surface. On the right hand side, these uh, gas streamlines, they did not lose enough angular momentum, therefore they don't end up on the planet, they're going to go back to the circumplanetary disk and eventually leave the planet vicinity. So again, what I mentioned before, that not everything which falls onto the planet is going to be contributing uh, to the planet right away. There is a lot of recycling going on uh, in the planet vicinity. When we talk about these high temperatures, like 10,000 K and so, um, we should also mention uh, ionization, especially hydrogen. Um, hydrogen recombination lines, such as H alpha, are widely used all across astrophysics to uh, trace operating objects. So the question rises, can we detect operating uh, planets, uh, forming planets with hydrogen recombination lines? So this is what we studied with Barbara Colano. And uh, here I'm showing you the uh, ionization fractions that I have found in the simulation. So this is now very close to the planet. This is the planet itself. And this is the hottest part of the shock front because only in these regions, we can ionize hydrogen and only if the planet is 10 Jupiter mass or larger. Unfortunately, smaller mass planets cannot be detected with H alpha because either the temperatures are not high enough to ionize hydrogen or the absorption is just too much inside the circumplanetary disk and above the circumplanetary disk that there is no detectable H alpha flux. So uh, I think this explains why we have only two uh, planet candidates that has been detected in H alpha. Probably these are very massive objects which are close to the brown dwarf regime. Uh, again, we are limited very much here in, in, the, uh, in the planet, uh, lower planet mass regime with um, extinction and absorption, unfortunately. So these simulations, uh, of course, are evolving in time. We, we can do better and better simulations because we have better and better supercomputers, faster and faster supercomputers. That means we can incorporate more and more physical effects that might control the planet formation process. So when we um, you know, uh, develop further our, our codes, what we are really uh, driven by is thinking about what, what physical mechanisms co could influence the planet formation process. What people do since many decades now is of course, um, the gravity and the fluid dynamics, fluid motions, because we have this gaseous disk, so we have to solve the, the hydrodynamic equations. And some of us have uh, started to do also um, thermodynamics with radiative transfer in order to determine temperatures and look into how the thermodynamics influences the uh, planetary accretion. What we find is what has been found in other parts of astrophysics is that the hotter is the planet vicinity, the lower it's going to be the planet accretion rate. Or in other words, the longer it takes the planet to form. And everything uh, determined by the opacity, so the local chemical composition, because that determines the cooling efficiency. And the cooling efficiency could, could be translated directly into uh, planetary operation. So what kind of composition we assume in the planet vicinity that's going to influence what our accretion rate we're going to get out in the simulations. And this is why also we need to know very well the chemical composition in order to know the right uh, or get the right results. And where the field is going in the future, I believe addition of magnetic fields. As also you heard in the previous talk, but uh, we have zero idea uh, how strong are the magnetic fields of forming planets. We don't know. We know that currently in the solar system, the magnetic fields of planets are few orders of magnitude smaller than the magnetic field of the, of the sun or the stars. But what uh, we also know from stellar astrophysics is that uh, when stars are still forming, their magnetic field is much stronger than it is today. And maybe this happens the same way for planets. So even though today planets have relatively small magnetic fields, maybe they had quite large at the, at the beginning, at the formation phase. And then 
this magnetic field could indeed influence the, the planetary accretion, the accretion stream and the planetary accretion rate. So this is, I think, where the, the field is going to go in the future. Now, not only the physics needs to be improved, but also we have to use the right numerical techniques. Uh, I showed in this talk that the planetary accretion is really much a 3D process. Therefore, we have to break away the 2D simulations, the whole limit plane simulations, and we need to run 3D simulations. Many of us also not trying to incorporate solids into our simulations and not only dealing with gases, but for example, uh, dust, astrophysical dust, micron size, millimeter size, centimeter size dust. Uh, you can do two different ways, either um, programming in particles that interact with the gas, or what we do in my group is multifluid approach, and here is an example of that. You see the dust density with orange color and the gas density with blue color. Uh, this is also important for determining the opacity, which then uh, influences the planetary accretion rate, so this is also why we have to care about solids. And I also a firm believer that we need to run global disk simulation. So that means that we have to have a circumstellar disk while we have also high res resolution patch uh, in the planet vicinity, which we can do, for example, with adaptive mesh refinement. Because uh, we need to, on one hand, resolve the planet's surface. If we want to talk about planetary accretion, we should measure the planetary accretion rate on the surface, in my opinion. And plus, um, we have all this very complex meridional circulation all the way from the circumstellar disk. We also have to catch that correctly. And all the global disk simulations can open a proper planetary gap, which also influencing the accretion rate of planets. So um, this is also what uh, many of us are now doing uh, using global disk simulations by having uh, mesh refinement in the planet vicinity. And few of us are doing higher order methods with Riemann solvers, not only for the accuracy, but also because Riemann solvers have shock solutions. And as you have just seen before, uh, shocks are extremely important in terms of planetary accretion. They determine the angular momentum transport, so they determine the planetary accretion rate. So this is the reason why we have to use the right technique to get out uh, the right numbers for uh, planetary growing rates. So in conclusion, um, the formation of planets and moons are quite complex and they require therefore complex numerical simulations, not in, only in terms of physics, but also in numerical methods. And this disk around the planet, the circumplanetary disk or circumplanetary envelope, determines a lot about planet formation in terms of time scale and what final masses of planets we're going to end up with. Everything about moon formation, the composition of these bodies, and how we can observe forming planets or how to make predictions to observe their circumplanetary material. Um, and finally, I just want to mention that even though I talked about here planet formation, but these simulations are very similar to, for example, uh, black hole accretion disk simulations. Uh, if you have a black hole pair instead of a star and planet, this, uh, the simulation results look quite similar. For those of you who work with uh, black hole accretion disk, the circumplanetary disk is the physical equivalent of the black hole mini disks. And uh, the circumstellar disk in this simulation would be the equivalent of the circumbinary black hole disk. So with some modification, these simulations can be also used to understand a little bit better uh, all kinds of uh, uh, accretion disk all across astrophysics. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Judy, for the very excellent talk. Um, I in think meantime. we can go to the section for questions now. So, so we have one question on Slack from Vivian Parmentier. Uh, congratulations yeah. for all the work. Hi, Vivian. Um, uh, I have one. I have a question. Does the meridional circulation have consequences for the final envelope metallicity because pebbled and dust might not follow perfectly the meridional flow due to gravitational sampling? Could you trace yes. pebbles in your models? Yes. So this is, this is what uh, we do with multifluid approach. And we have a very uh, new paper, which you can find on Astro PH <laughs> exactly about this. So the meridional circulation can bring with itself uh, what we found in even millimeter size particles quite efficiently bridging over the planetary gap. And therefore we can deposit these solids into the heosphere, into the circumplanetary disk quite efficiently. And this was 
not really uh, known before, or people thought that the pebble isolation mass, uh, the gap edges are really holding back the pebbles, but we found that this Meridiana circulation, the spider of X can help bridge over the planetary gap and deliver efficiently the pebbles, and therefore we might have indeed uh, different metallicity in this region. Thanks. Uh, if we have time for another question from Rohita uh, Budacharya, I'm sorry for the name pronunciation. Interesting, I was wondering how large circumstellar planetary disk can be and how it affects the number of moons. Yes, so the circumplanetary disks are the subset of the heosphere of the planet. The heosphere of the planet is the gravitational influence sphere. The circumplanetary disk could be approximated by half or one third of the heosphere, roughly. And uh, the moons are forming within, so this is why we're going to find the moons relatively close to the giant planets, because they can be only in, say, in the inner half of the heosphere or so, at least during the formation phase. Later on, they can scatter around a little bit more, but during the formation phase, they're going to be quite tightly packed around the, around the giant planet. And uh, which one more uh, from the Slack from Trisha Bomilk. Uh, great talk. Uh, can you give an idea of how can we observe or detect the CPD embedded in a continuous circumstellar disk? Yeah, so we also have a couple of uh, actually four papers out about this. It seems like the ALMA wavelengths are the best to do so to distinguish between the circumplanetary and circumstellar disk. So um, we need to go to submillimeter, say band nine uh, or band seven with ALMA. These are the best uh, wavelength range to try to detect circumplanetary disk and therefore pinpoint forming planets in, in, uh, in circumstellar disks. There are more questions? I currently so see no other question. I'm just looking again, no. I I can use the last couple of minutes for a very quick one. So, so most of the planets uh, in exoplanetary systems are between super Earth and, and Neptune mass. And, and it's clearly, you know, sort of a, a very specific mass range. And I was wondering what would be the predictions of the current simulations in terms of formation of the CPD around these objects and, and the, the moon formation also yes. around. Yeah, so what, uh, what is a currently ongoing project, so it's not published yet, but what we found is that a roughly super Earth regime is when you can form circumplanetary disk, depending on what is the opacity. We are talking about uh, planet masses between, say, 10 to 18 Earth masses. Depending on what opacity you, you assume, this is the range where the envelope collapses into a circumplanetary disk. So exactly this super Earth versus Neptune mass regime. So I think it might have an influence also on, on this, um, like whether a planet will end up as a super Earth versus uh, a Neptune type planet. I, I, I have a feeling that maybe the circumplanetary disk has something to do with it for the formation of the circumplanetary disk. But this is still very much ongoing uh, you know, research. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. And thanks again and congratulations. And uh, we now have to move to the last uh, Merak Prize uh, talk. Uh, that is for the prize of observation on astrophysics, uh, which uh, went to Dr. Cosimo and Sarah from Cardiff University for the investigation of the extremes in stellar explosions, providing a pioneering contribution to their understanding and their role in astronomy and astrophysics. And I think it's now time to show the certificate, which is already uh, viewable. Thanks again uh, and congratulations. I leave the stage to Cosimo. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizers to give me this opportunity to talk about the, the science I love. Second, if you're seeing this video, it means that basically my uh, internet connection clamorously failed and I was not able to deliver these with the bandwidth available. So I hope to see you at the end of this talk and to take you and to reply to any questions you might have about supernovae and what's happened to extreme supernovae. As you can see from my talk, this is called Supernova Frontier, beyond standard stellar demises. And it will focus on the extreme of the supernova population. So 
the first part, I have to introduce what is a supernova event. So if you remember, or if you've been uh, reading around and, and, and or working on supernova, you know that basically there are two main mechanisms to produce a uh, supernova explosion, which is the destruction of uh, the uh, catastrophic destruction of a star. The first channel is the thermonuclear supernova, where you have a binary system. One of the two stars in the system has to be a white dwarf, and the other might be a, a red supergiant or another degenerate object, in that case, another white dwarf. No matter what is the scenario, the final outcome of this is going to be the disruption of the white dwarf or both the white dwarfs and the happening of a thermonuclear supernova, which also goes by the ID of type 1a supernova. Uh, the other channel is said that of core collapse supernovae, where you have a, a, a massive stars, which is more than eight mass, uh, uh, more than eight solar masses during the zero age main sequence stars. When it will, it will evolve at a certain point, it will run out of uh, nuclear energies, the uh, nuclear pressures will run out, will not withstand the gravity of all this material, and what will happen is the collapse of the core. And as a consequence, it's going to be the explosion of the star itself, and you will have a core collapse, supernova explosion. As you can imagine, since there are so many different kinds of massive stars, as you can see from this picture, uh, there's going to be several different kinds of core collapse supernovae explosions, and as a concept, different kind of signatures in their uh, in the explosion themselves. One or other for in, on the other end from thermonuclear supernovae, that is going to be just one, or let's say one-ish, because there are going to be slightly differences between scenarios and chemical arrangements. However, overall, as any almost any other things in astronomy, we can disentangle, we can create our taxonomy and disentangle what is thermonuclear, what is core collapse, looking at the luminosity evolution of at the luminosity evolution here of um, the supernova explosion and the spectra at different times, the electromagnetic at different times. As you can see here, we have different shapes of the luminosity evolution for different kinds of supernovae. But the, the key point is that all of them are mainly driven, principally driven by nickel decay, this nickel 56, which is an isotope of nickel, which is creating do, created during the supernova explosion. And the, um, the process, the nuclear process to go from nickel 56 to cobalt 56 will release photons. And these photons are actually the main luminosity, what drives the luminosity, the main luminosities of the supernova event. And that is basically true for any kind of supernova. However, there are some little exceptions. For example, if you are in a case of core collapse supernova and your supernova had hydrogen, you will also have another power source, which is the hydrogen recombination. And you will see what is called a 2P, where you have this kind of plateau. Or if there is a little, uh, no much hydrogen, you can see this 2L where the decline is linear. However, there is still be the nickel part, which is still powering uh, the main light curves of the supernova, but there is going to be something else. In principle, there is a third mechanism. There is another mechanism to create additional luminosities. There is not an exploding mechanism, it's just a mechanism to create additional luminosities, which is the interaction of the supernova, which is expanding into the cosmos, with the material previously lost by the, the star that ended as a supernova. This is called circumstellar interaction because you have two mediums interacting each other. The supernova ejector, which collides with the wind, the material previously expelled by the, super, by the progenitor star in terms of a wind or in terms of eruption, and they will create additional energy. How can we disentangle the, these different kinds of supernova events? The light curves itself might not be uh, the unique give out for their uh, belonging to core collapse or what kind of core collapse or thermonuclear. What we have to see is also look at the spectra and the spectra evolution. This is actually a snapshot of spectra at the maximum uh, light of the luminosity evolution. And as you can see, the different kind of supernova will have different elements. The B here is the type two supernova, which is coming from a red supergiant or a blue supergiant, which you, you will have a lot of hydrogen. This is the spectrum of a thermonuclear supernova, which as you can see is quite different from these three, which are coming from core collapse supernovae. 
the more you lose the 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 external layer so if you lose hydrogen and helium you go you go for from coral up in the regime of what is our called stupid envelope uh, supernova because the, the envelope, the outer envelope of the stars that were stripped by wind, by eruption before exploding as a supernova. And when they explode as a supernova, they do best you not have hydrogen or hydrogen and helium. In this case, they're going to be this kind of core collapse supernovae. So this is basically the, 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 the bread and butter that we have to know to, to actually understand the rest of the talk. And what is to refresh our knowledge of supernova. So now we can go a little bit further. We can go out from our comfort zone, open the door of our house or full of supernova and see what else there is outside. So if we place all these supernova, the thermonuclear and the core collapse, all of them in what is called the phase luminosity diagram of the supernova population, they only encompass just a small part of this entire diagram. So type 1a supernovae, or that are the thermonuclear supernovae, they're going to be just in this region and core collapse all over there. So that's really a small part of what we can actually see in terms of just taking different rise times and different luminosities. But how much of this space is actually physically possible with this mechanism? If you take some caveats and you do some uh, simple calculation where you uh, take in account the amount of material created by Nico and how much more luminosity you can get if there is hydrogen recombination and what is the ratio, the maximum ratio for Nico to the rest of the material which is spelled in the supernova, which is roughly should not happen more than 20%. You can create these two lines in this diagram, which are the, the theoretical limit for a term, for a core collapse supernova and a thermonuclear supernova, which roughly divides this diagram in two parts. What is physically possible in the bottom right and what is not physically possible with these two mechanisms in the top left. So you can see here, they're still missing something, which we, in, in honest, we are starting to find. But the most interesting thing is that roughly 10 years ago, we started to populate a zone we should that we should not see that it shouldn't be populated. So and we are finding more and more of these objects, and we started to find a lot of objects which are long lived and very luminous. And then in the last three four years, we started to find a lot of very fast objects. See these these time scales here is in is is a log scale. So these are they rise, they explode, and get to the maximum in less than 10 days, and they have a huge variety of luminosities. Okay, you might say, okay, some of them, they are below the threshold, and they might be explained with no normal mechanism, but the majority of them are beyond. So we have these two population. These bright transits are called superluminous supernovae. Yeah, there is not much of, of imagination in calling such a things because they're very luminous. And these are, are called fast transit. Okay, some of you now might think, of, thought, oh, I know a few objects that are very fast, or they can change uh, time scale very, with respect of the of the scenario of happening. And those are Novi and Akira Nova, and that is true. I mean, Novi they will be a little bit below this area, while Akira Nova is just down there. So they are they are slightly different kind of happening. Now I'm going to focus a little bit more and try to present to you these two extreme cases of supernova because they're extreme, because we, we have no clue at the beginning what can actually power these objects. You might say, oh, but this guy just said a few slides ago that there is this interaction between the ejector spanning and the circumstellar material previously expelled by the supernova. And that is true, you can play a lot with interaction material, but the majority of the things that are going to be in this region, some of them that might be over here, but they usually are going to be very, very long lived. And you will see very specific signature in this electromagnetic spectrum. And I'll come back to that in a few slides. So let's talk about these uh, first object, these superluminous supernovae. Uh, as you can see here, 
they are much brighter than normal supernovae. They're actually five to 100 times brighter than normal supernovae. And the other, the other uh, since they are that bright, they have been observed up to redshift two with photometry and up to redshift four, uh, sorry, two with spectroscopy and up to redshift four with photometry. The other interesting bit is that they always happen or during the majority of times, roughly 95% of the times, they happen in very dwarf galaxies and low metal acid environments. That would already suggest all of you, these are going to be very interesting how the high redshift to explore the high redshift scenarios of uh, explosions and, and massive stars ending up as supernovae. And, but how can we explain these, these luminosities? If you take normal supernovae, and this actually is how we derive these theoretical limits in, in the previous diagram, you can roughly take as the amount of nickel produced during the supernova explosion will tell you how bright a supernova might be and the amount of material expelled into the cosmos to tell you how wide the luminosity evolution it is. And this ratio cannot exceed the 0 0.2. So the nickel cannot be more than 20% of the entire mass. To get these, the first idea was, okay, maybe we had some kind of mechanism which produced very, very bright supernova with a lot of mass and a lot of nickel. And that is the parent stability scenario where you actually you ended up with very massive stars, which have helium cores of even more than 100 solar masses. So these are very giant. And everybody agrees that this should happen in very, almost zero metallicity environment like these superluminous supernovae. And they de at the end, they do not explode for due to core collapse. They do not explode as a thermonuclear, but do explode with that third mechanism, which is this pair, this sabidis, because you start to have uh, pair couples that are going to be create this ability and they will destroy the supernova. Basically, since there is a lot of uh, production of metals in the uh, of, of uh, iron peak elements in this case, and uh, these basically you can imagine these as a scale up version of a thermonuclear event. So there would be uh, there would be a lot of metals. There will be some CNO elements, but they'll be very bright. However, since they are so big stars, for diffusion time scales, they have to be very long rise and very and very long decay. This decay would be the one dashed here in this plot. So they will be they're going to be even slower than what we observe in superluminous supernova. And even the rise time is going to be a factor of two to three years slower than what we observed. So most likely this is not the case. So what about this CSM interaction, which Bessie can do almost everything. It does marvelous things and it can reproduce a lot of things, a lot of uh, supernovae. But, however, what we see in the electromagnetic spectrum, when we see an interaction between some material and a circumstellar material is something like this. We see lines which are in emission with Laurentian wings. And that is due to see if you have hydrogen, in your ejector and your CSM, or you do not have hydrogen in your ejector and your CSM, but you have all just helium because you lost the hydrogen. And the same goes would be if you leave the, the helium, you will actually see some CNO elements, but you will see these emission lines with Laurentian wings. So you will not see anything of this absorption and emission, which is typical of supernovae and is also typical of these superluminous supernovae. So what these kind of profiles, because the uh, absorption and emission are called p signy profiles because are the typical profiles of an expanding uh, um, uh, co-moving material. This is what we see actually in superluminous supernova. So we do not see any sign, clear sign of interaction. Then another interesting thing we then see is that actually these stars, they do resemble the same spectra of stupid envelope supernovae. So these two in the center are superluminous supernovae. And the one on the top and the one on the bottom are standard supernovae. The, the spectra in terms of chemical composition are very similar, but the interesting bits is that the, the phase is completely different. These two are at peak luminosities for normal supernovae, but these are 30 days later. So there is kind of a shift in the, the evolution. So they are more luminous and the evolution is kind of delayed at the beginning, but then it stops after 30 days. These are the spectra we see for a long, long time, even 100, 100 days after. So the third proposed mechanism was that of a magnetar. A magnetar is a very fast spinning neutron stars 
with a very highly magnetic fields of roughly 10 to the 14 Gauss. So we have observed 20, roughly a little bit more than 20 magnets are in our own galaxies, and they're all spun up. The magnets are needed in this case that are fa much, much faster because they goes up to 10 milliseconds of spin period. And this actually been able to reproduce with this model, the light curves, as you can see here, and for these I'm guilty of charge, like a lot of other people that we are not actually sure that this was working with the main observables in supernova science, but they also be able to explain a lot of other uh, happening and what we see in this superluminous supernova, even up to what we see with spectroplarimetric observation. So you would say, okay, case is solved. We know there's a monitor. We guess it's a monitor. We still have not completely understood how this extra injection of mag magnetorotational energy properly works. And we do not see any we are signature of the magnetar or the magnetar with nebula. We have these models which can reproduce it, but the models are always based on what we believe we know about this case and how this energy is transmitted to the supernova. But there is no real observational signature at the moment of a magnetar scenario. So it's the best one, but still without definitive proof. Okay, you would say this guy is, got, is going to talk about all these things for, for, for a little bit. So why should you care? Why anybody sitting now in uh, at the end of at the other end of this Zoom call might be uh, want to know about this superluminous supernovae? Uh, first of all, because they are bright, and we can actually start to explore with supernovae the realization epoch. We could also be able to explore the ISM around these stars, and then actually the composition we see of chemical elements in the galaxies to UV absorption. Uh, cause uh, of the ISM in front of these uh, object. And then they can also give us chemical enrichment of a cosmos dominated by population three stars and the first supernova. But my favorite part is that they can in principle be using cosmology. So the key, the cosmologies that is in you might recognize these are the Apple diagram, where you can see the distance versus uh, two distances calculated in terms of velocity, in terms of redshift, and in terms of uh, the distance modulus. And here you can see all the different kind of cosmologies and what was previously done with Type 1A supernovae, which was the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize in 2011. So this is what we see with in supernovae. However, some of these superluminous supernovae, <coughs> sorry, uh, can be used can be able to be standardized and can be used in cosmology. And then is what you see. And this is interesting because they can be expanded up to redshift that cannot be probed with type 1A supernovae. And they can actually tell us how the evolution of the cosmos went into that, into that epoch. You might say, OK, the, the, the residuals are not that good. And it's stupid because we are limited by our statistics. We have roughly 20 objects that are standardized uh, of those that are standardizable versus now 1,000 of type 1A supernovae. However, those are the same numbers we had at the beginning of type 1A cosmologies, which had 20 years of improving. So if we get more of them, we might achieve the same results of, of today and be independently proved type 1A cosmology and also probe that at high redshift. So that is, that's, is fascinating from my point of view. So let's now move on to the other kind of objects, because I'm aware that I might be also a little bit late of time. Uh, these are these fast transients. How can we define fast transients? Basically, are all the transients, which then half of their evolution is happening in less than 12 days soon after peak luminosity. This is what you call a fast transient. But as you can see here, there are a lot of luminosities. They cover six magnitudes of luminosities. This is, this is a huge amount that cannot be explained with the same mechanism or with the same kind of gentle scenario. So what does power these fast transients, which they also been called as FBOS, fast blue optical transients? Actually, at the beginning, there were more different names to call this object than object themselves. So this is a, it's quite interesting how actually astronomers like to give um, acronyms to, to the things they discover. So we can disentangle these 
uh, Platora, this huge range of luminosities for the phosphonates in three different regions, the yellow, the, the, the blue, and the red. So very luminous, medium luminosities, and faint. So there are several suggestions that have been used to explain them. For example, again, among them are coming from an interstellar interstellar merger or from an electro capture supernova can display both the middle and very bright luminosities. While tidal disruption events can explain the very bright luminosities or the shock breakout of the supernova, but it's still happening in an extended envelope, which is usually a very, has a very sharp rise and it's very luminous and very hot. It can explain all of them because different kind of, of uh, densities and chemical composition and time scale can explain the different luminosities and the, the shock breakout itself will, will explain the steep rise. However, if you go to the middle faint region, this is where the things come to such interesting because some of the mergers, we can also produce gravitational waves signatures can produce this kind of fast functions, like a neutral star's black hole merger, or sometimes also a neutral star's uh, white dwarf merger. So why these are important? These objects are important because they can answer these two questions. They can allow us to understand how the cosmos is evolving, and especially what is the aftermath of a compact star merger that can also produce gravitational wave signature. So now I'm all, almost at the end of this talk, and I'm going to focus a little bit on what is the future of these, of these extreme supernova and what are going to be the challenges. So the futures in terms of surveys providing these new amazing data that they, we need to solve the puzzle of understanding the projector scenarios and mechanisms for these extreme constants are these. And as the slide says, this is a completely biased view of what I think are going to be the main, uh, the, main, um, the main players in delivering new kind of information. First of all, we would need always to get spectra of, of these objects. And for these, currently we're using uh, the survey that I'm leading, which is Presto Plus, and we will lead, uh, we will uh, happening until the end of 2022 when it will replace by SOX, PI, Sergio Campana, from Ina Fabrera, which will also target these kind of two, of two extreme transient. And some of these, they can be also targeted by Formos, guys, Royal de Jong, and which in principle, you can get a lot of um, super luminous supernovae and the majority of the host galaxies of both these kind of extreme transient. However, to get them very early in the evolution, which we, information during the rise time of these extreme trans, like any other supernova, can reveal a lot of information about the, uh, the progenitors. And for these extreme trans, it has been very, very difficult to get spectroscopic information in that phase. So uh, service like Black Jam, its PI is Paul Root, or even LSST, which will deliver a lot of them, will be very, very important. In fact, if you see LSST and Euclid is going to be very important, from a cosmology point of view, because they will deliver thousands of superluminous in the next decade, which are that is really the number we need to get the statistical position down in superluminous superluminous cosmology. You might wonder, what about the systematics, which has been the, the main big point for type 1a cosmology? I do not have the time, but I will actually be super happy to reply to these for any questions uh, that you might have at the end of this talk. On top of that, LSST will also deliver, it, and that's only LSST, only 45,000 of these fast funds. And so there is going to be a lot of them. We'll finally enter in the statistical numbers we need to better understand, probe them, and understand their project. And I will leave now here, leaving you these take home messages, which are also the conclusionary talks. And I'm now open to take any questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. I think we may have time for just one question maybe from the Slack. So I'm looking at both the Slack and the Q&A. Currently, there's, uh, there's one uh, by David Aguilera Dena. Very interesting talk. What would you be a smoking gun to prove whether magnetars power or not SLS NE? So uh, I would say uh, my opinion is going to be X-ray emission. If you can see uh, an X-ray emission coming, 
out in the first few days after the, the onset of the supernova, it will actually be a signature of, of the magnetar, which might puncture actually the ejector with the formation of the beam. And the same, basically, same kind of mechanism happened with gamma reverse. So that is one of the of the signature. All, all the other things we can actually get in the very few days soon after their, their explosion can actually rule out all the other scenarios, which will leave the magnetar as the only one. But only X-ray can actually tell us if they are man, yeah, magnetar powered or not. Thank you very much. Uh, so I guess at this point, I, I leave it to Connie to continue uh, sharing the session. And I thank you a lot again, uh, Cosimo, for the great talk and congratulate for the prize. Sorry for the epic failure of the computer. It, it, it was a nice talk anyway. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Lucia. Let me, of course, also uh, congratulate the three uh, awardees, but also Lucio for uh, having accepted to co-chair this uh, session of the Merak Crisis at very last minute. And above all, I would like to express my great gratitude to the Merak Foundation for their continuous support. It's very important for us to be able to give uh, pats on the back to young researchers who are brilliant uh, uh, researchers in our community. And I insist on thanking the foundation for this opportunity. And now uh, with, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the last uh, talk of this session. And I would also like to say that we're not gonna punish the speaker because she was very well prepared and rehearsed with us. So please bear with us for five more minutes than originally foreseen due to the technical problems we had. Um, let me introduce to you the uh, uh, last plenary speaker of today, Alces Bonanos, who is a senior researcher at the National Observatory of Athens, where she works after PhD studies in uh, Harvard and several prestigious postdoctoral uh, positions in the United States. Good afternoon from Athens. I first of all would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present about massive star evolution. Um, I would first like to mention that there are two related symposia, actually Symposium 16 and Special Session 22 at uh, EAS that happened earlier this week on massive stars, birth rotation and chemical evolution. And the second one is on the great dimming of Betelgeuse, the news from the mass loss of red supergiants, which were very interesting and had nice results. Now, why talk about massive star evolution? Isn't this a solved, uh, a soft question. Well, I want to motivate uh, the discussion with this HR diagram. And it turns out that um, it's not a solved problem. It's still a very active uh, field of research, uh, both from the theoretical aspect and observational uh, parts. Now, uh, this uh, diagram shows, um, it's a bit complex. It's for solar metallicity. It has evolutionary tracks masses. Now we're focusing on the top part of it, high luminosities, where we find the various uh, types of massive stars, the massive star zoo. Let me walk you through it. We have what's going on here, shown the Wolf Rayet stars, which are located in the top left corner, um, overlapping a little bit with them are the blue supergiants and the peculiar, peculiar and actually rare supergiant B bracket E stars which have uh, narrow emission lines and are very rare. Above them are the luminous blue variables, which by definition are luminous and blue and variable. And uh, they are limited by the Humphreys-Davidson limit at the top, this black line. This shows uh, the modified emission limits, so where stars become unstable <clears throat> due to their opaque winds, and, uh, which is lower um, at, uh, for redder stars. Um, we also have the yellow hypergiants, the yellow supergiants uh, to the right of that. Um, and finally, the red supergiants that are the, the, the reddest of all. Now, um, the color scale indicates the surface number abundance of nitrogen. And the gray shaded area shows the Cepheid instability strip. Now, traditionally, the, the progenitors of supergiants were thought to be wolf rayet stars, blue supergiants, and red supergiants. It turns out recently that uh, several other of these classes of stars seem to 
be found as progenitors of supernovae as well. So one of the questions is how do we do this mapping or which stars produce supernovae and which stars, which massive stars produce which supernovae? What is the exact evolutionary state of each of these stars? Some blue supergiants could be uh, moving toward the blue or some could be moving toward the red. And that is not always clear. <clears throat> um, and which explored a supernova. So all these questions are open and are trying to be addressed by both theoretical and observational uh, works. Now, um, moving on. So here's the mapping that we'd like to do. Uh, we have all, so the, at the top left, you see the various uh, types of massive stars. We'd like to know which are the final states and which supernovae they lead to. Uh, on this diagram here, this pie chart is from Smith et al. 2011 from the Lick Observatory Supernova Search. It was a volume limited survey within 60 megaparsecs and included 80 core collapse supernovae. Uh, the two Ps, the majority of, uh, are, of these are uh, due to red supergiants. The 1BCs are um, strip stars. They don't have hydrogen, so they're thought to come from strip stars that happen from binary Roche lobe overflow. <clears throat> um, but the predictions of types of massive stars from evolutionary models are not too solid yet. Now, this is a plot from Langer's review paper in 2012 showing the state of the art of massive star evolution. Uh, it's far from final. We have the mass of the zero age main sequence on the bottom, on the x axis, and on the y axis, the time evolution. The bottom plot is for the hydrogen burning stage and the top part for the helium burning stage. Um, so yeah, main sequence and post main sequence are labeled here. Now it's um, a vertical line at any mass would show you the evolution, at least qualitatively of, uh, for example, an OB dwarfed an O giant, and then to blue, maybe red super giant, and eventually perhaps some type of w, uh, N or WC dwarf a star at the final stages. And the final output is a WC. Now the goal is to complete this evolutionary sequence by um, having more accurate mass masses here and finalizing the plot with uh, the type of core collapse supernova or the final end product. Of course, there are many parameters that make this complex such as metallicity, rotation, binarity and various input physics that affect the outcome and make this task more complicated. <coughs> now, the physical processes are outlined nicely by Langer et al. Um, there's mass loss, of course, which affects um, the evolution. It exists in all phases due to high luminosity of the stars. It can be found in the main sequence. It can be radiative, line-driven winds are highly structured or clumped. Um, there's a mass, there's a metallicity dependence uh, on this. And post main sequence also uh, present um, radiative winds. Although for red supergiants and wolf Rayet winds, um, the physics of mass loss is not well understood because winds are pretty thick and they can, they can become super eddington uh, in the external layers, layers. We also have mechanical mass loss. Uh, which is due to fast rotation and equatorial mass loss uh, when surface velocity, which is, which is critical. Then there's rotation, which strongly affects the evolution of massive stars, um, just like the mass and the metallicity. It reduces the stellar luminosity, it increases the central density, lowers the central temperature, and causes mixing. And surface abundance changes uh, are evident everywhere in sequence. Metallicity, obviously, uh, changes the metal content of the stars, it affects the mass loss, the line-driven winds, um, and various other uh, processes. Binarity, so I've, I've highlighted with purple the ones I'm gonna talk about a bit more in this uh, presentation. Um, binarity has been shown to be extremely important among massive stars. 75% of all stars are thought to interact, either via mass transfer, common envelope of evolution or mergers. 50% while on the main sequence. Um, then there's thermally induced mixing, which are also called overshooting, which relates to the motion of convective fluid elements beyond the border between convectively unstable and radiatively stable layers. This border is fluctuating in space and time, so it's difficult to account for it with 1D models. 
finding their magnetic fields, which can be stable fields, dynamo generated fields, or uh, intermittent fields. Um, either they could be fossil fields inherited by the original cloud or stellar mergers, the dynamo, dynamo generated ones are due to differentially rotating radiative surfaces or envelopes, sorry. Um, and, and intermittent fields can be caused by winding small fields by differential rotation. Now, all these effects um, have predictions that can be confirmed by observations, such as the surface abundances, uh, the, the ratios in the galaxy of blue supergiants to red supergiants, referring it to O supergiants. Um, red supergiants and Wolfrayet stars, and also within the Wolfrayet types, the WC to WN stars. It also affects the width of the main sequence, the maximum luminosity for red supergiants, the mass range for stars undergoing blue loops. Also, how long does a star live on the main sequence? How long is it in the red supergiant or the Wolfrayet phase? What's the minimum mass of a star to enter the Wolfrayet phase? All these are predicted by models, depending on these parameters, and to be measured with observations. And finally, also there, the spectra, what the spectra of end stage stars look like uh, can also be predicted. Now, perhaps the most important factor is the mass. It's the most fundamental parameter for evolutionary models, <clears throat> but accurate, fund, accurate measurements are only provided by binaries. For eclipsing spectroscopic binaries, uh, in theory, you can go to 1%, although for the most massive stars, this is not very easy to achieve. Um, my favorite um, eclipsing binary, of course, is WR20A in West Room 2. It's still one of the highest masses uh, measured accurately. Uh, 3.7 day period, still, I'm still uh, impressed by these 80 solar mass, 280 solar mass stars uh, revolving around each other every 3.7 days. Um, as we all know, massive stars are rare and they don't live very long, so it's very hard to find enough stars in these configurations to measure them to have a large enough sample. But uh, each one of these is uh, very important and valuable for constraining models. Now for um, astrometric spectroscopic binaries, these are also uh, very important for obtaining fundamental parameters and masses. They provide slightly less accuracy, about 5%. Uh, here's an example from a, a large study um, showing an example of how uh, the observations of astrometry and spectroscopic binaries can be combined to obtain um, <clears throat> masses and uncertainties. Although for this specific case, if you only use the orbit and distance, uh, and if you combine with this, the rate of velocities, uh, the masses, um, the results in the masses are quite different and actually quite uncertain with the rate of velocities because they're not very well constrained. So. Um, and also, we also have to keep in mind that even though there are a lot of binaries, few are in the right configuration to produce eclipses for us to see. Now, <clears throat> here's a table of the most massive stars measured in, uh, in binaries. Most of them are eclipsing binaries. The ones that have a greater sign are not eclipsing, so that's why we have minimum masses for these. Um, actually, these are all I'm aware of, so there are not that many. Uh, but as I mentioned before, each one of them is very valuable. Um, now you might notice that the most massive ones have this very similar spectral type, WN6HA. So these are part of the hydrogen burning Wolfray stars. Um, the hydrogen burning Wolfray stars, right, that are not, they're not involved. So um, I should move on. This time is short. Now, binarity. There's evidence for high multiplicity fraction. Spectroscopic surveys of galactic B stars point to binarity, binarity fraction of 70%. There are other methodologies also like speckle interferometry, adaptive optics, like e-imaging, uh, all pointing uh, to this high multiplicity fraction, especially among massive stars. Um, of course, their intense observations are needed to discover these binaries, especially spectroscopic binaries, um, and methods resolving the binaries are limited to our galaxy. So here's the plot about the number of stars being <clears throat> um, single, or, or uh, effectively single, only 30%, and the rest are um, products of binary evolution. Now, coming to mass loss, 
Um, we have a plot here from Smith uh, showing um, the various mass loss rates from the literature. Uh, also uh, showing the, the, plate, the mass loss rates measured from, for various types of stars. For example, red supergiants, there's a prescription by Van Loon and by De Jager. And this is approximate where they're approximately the position where they've been measured. Um, you can see there's a lot of uncertainty and there are a lot of di different prescriptions for different types of stars. Um, for now, this gray line is the limit for line driven winds. So you can't exceed this mass loss with line driven winds. For typical OB stars, O stars, you have the De Jager of Vink et al. prescriptions. Then you have De Jager divided by three or divided by 10. So these are prescriptions people use in the models. There's the weak wind problem. So it appears that the, the early B, late O stars have weaker winds than predicted. And they follow this green line. Uh, if we go to well, WN, WC stars are up here, yellow hypergiants up here, and extreme red supergiants are higher up. Binary Roche lobe overflow is somewhere up here, and luminous blue variable eruptions are expected to be the upper right. This is an assumption based on Ada Karina, the mass lost over 10 years places it up there. <clears throat> so, um, it's not a very satisfying plot, and I understand that put, that these um, these numbers and these relations are put into evolutionary models. Now let's see what's actually happening, what we know from observations. So let's look at the closest red supergiant, Betelgeuse. Um, the closest, the closest circular environment was studied by Kervel et al. in 2011. Uh, the, the, the large nebula here that you see is complex, a bright circumstellar nebula extending up to 134 AU, observed at 10 microns by Vizier, by Vizier VLT. Um, you, it's very, very large, extends up to several tens of stellar radii. And uh, what I want you to notice is that at the very center, there's a central disk observed by VLT NACO, a hot, compact, gaseous, gaseous, gaseous envelope extending to 3.4 AU in JHK band. So very complex circumstellar um, environment. There's mass lost, not uniformly, of course, uh, possibly due to pulsations of the star. Perhaps there's been some eruption. Um, now, you may have heard of the great dimming of Betelgeuse that uh, happened uh, last year. Um, from November 2019 to March 2020, Betelgeuse experienced a historic dimming. And although it usually has an apparent magnitude between 0.11 magnitude, it decreased, uh, its visual brightness decreased to 1.6 magnitudes in February, 2020. Um, these observations here from VLT sphere were occurring before, the year before and during and after this uh, dimming. So we actually see the change uh, where the Southern hemisphere Betelgeuse became 10 times darker than usual. It seems that a dust cloud formed recently in the vicinity of the star uh, due to a local soil pressure decrease and in a cool patch that appeared on the photosphere. So this is uh, the various dimmings of Betelgeuse seem to be explained um, by um, by the pulsation convective activity. And uh, it turns out that great, this great dimming is most likely not related, uh, is not an indication of an imminent explosion as a supernova. Now, uh, other evidence for mass loss comes from nebulae around massive stars. In 2010, there were two independent studies by Baramazi et al. and Vaster et al. who discovered nebulae by searching Spitzer 24 micron images of the galaxy of our Milky Way in the LMC. Uh, Baramazi et al. found 115 nebulae and uh, found that they were all associated with LBVs and late WNL uh, type wolf Rayet stars. They also obtained spectra of 24 stars to confirm the, the nature of these central stars. Um, these were not known previously. You can see this is a candidate LBV, wolf Rayet, candidate LBV, and another wolf Rayet. These stars are losing mass via copious stellar wind or instant outbursts. 
similar result was reached by the other group, the 62 shells observed, and also confirmed the nature with uh, spectra for some of them. Um, we also have evidence for mass losing events from the supernova community. For example, supernova 2009 IP is an interesting example. Was it an LBV that went supernovae? Well, we definitely know that it went through several outbursts right before its final outburst, which was the supernova, and actually um, confused people and they called it a supernova with the first outburst right here <clears throat> in 2009. Um, but it took three years to till it finally exploded and it's still also uh, not accepted by all these results with contested. And there are also other uh, supernovae as well. Uh, supernova, supernova type 2n that indicate uh, interactions with circumstellar material, even in low metallicity galaxies, which is very interesting. A uh, quote here from Smith's review paper, uh, luminous blue variable eruptions and pre-supernova eruptions are a major unsolved problem in astrophysics. And I'd like to focus on this uh, for the rest of the talk because the physical mechanism is not understood nor accounted for in evolutionary models. <clears throat> and it's uh, actually uh, the direction of, that my research has taken in the last few years. Now, mass losing stars, uh, what can help us observe them is that mass losing stars form dust and are bright in the mid infrared. So what uh, the, the technique, the methodology our group is using is hinging on this fact. Here we have our work based on the LMC back in 2009 which uh, shows a Spitzer CMD, so 3.6 microns versus 3.6 minus 4.5. Uh, and the massive stars are color-coded here and by various shapes and uh, colors. And you can see that they have, they're very luminous in the mid infrared, and they uh, are in, found in distinct locations. So the supergiant B brachides are these blue diamonds. The red supergiants are these red inverted triangles. LBVs are black circles. And they're at the very top, and they stick out from the rest of the stars in the LMC. Um, now, what's also interesting is that um, Object X, which I was part of this publication, uh, is a very luminous source, the most luminous mid infrared source in M33, but it was only discovered uh, once people looked at the Spitzer images. And it's very similar to variable A in M33 and the galactic source IRC plus 10, 420 which uh, has undergone some mass losing events, um, indicating that these are probably similar in nature as well. Although object X uh, seems to be a super symbiotic uh, object with a massive hypergiant, hot, uh, full hypergiant and an OB companion. Now, our group has uh, conducted several studies based on mid-infrared selection criteria starting with Britaski et al. in 2015, Kurniotz et al., uh, Williams et al., and PrEP now. Um, we have focused on dwarf irregular galaxies and shown that indeed uh, 13 red supergiants were found with mid-infrared selection criteria. Also yellow supergiants were probed uh, this way using such criteria. And uh, we also looked at M83 and found 10 red supergiant candidates where we have chemo spectrum of these. Now, here are some SED fits for yellow supergiants in M33. These are two examples uh, with multiple dust components, possibly originating from past mass loss events. Uh, this is the optical JHK band, and you have four Y's bands, and the two first Spitzer bands over here. Um, we found three warm dust shells. Uh, so the SED fitting also yields effective temperatures, radii, volumetric luminosities, and dust temperatures. Uh, of the 21 yellow supergiants we had in our sample, eight of these showed evidence for hot dust, eight for cool dust, and six had evidence for both hot and cool dust. Now, uh, with this consolidator grant from the ERC that I was awarded in 2017, I'm able to expand this project with uh, my group here, you can see Frank Tremper, Grigoris Maravellas, Ming Yang, and Stefan De Witt. Um, the project is called Episodic Mass Loss and Evolved Massive Stars, Key to Understanding the Explosive Early Universe. 
And the goal is to determine the role of episodic mass loss in the evolution of single massive stars. Now there are several steps. The first step is to find a way to classify stars and find these dusty massive evolved stars. And we are using state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms to automatically classify and select these stars. The second step is to, con to conduct a large observational survey, a spectroscopic survey of a thousand dust evolved stars in 27 nearby galaxies, spanning a large range of metallicity. Uh, after, once we have the spectra, we are doing SED and stellar atmosphere modeling to measure the parameters and mass loss for all these stars. And the final step is to do a comparison with evolutionary models uh, to see what mass loss is needed to be input into the models in order to um, find to be able to match the observations and the measurements that we have made and to do reverse engineering for some stars and see what kind of episodic mass loss is needed to, uh, to match the spectrum that we observe for these late uh, type stars, late stage in their evolution stars. Here's some first results from um, uh, our machine learning, the, the first step of the project. We have a paper by Maravellis et al. submitted to the ANA more than a month ago. It was a bit hard to find a referee. Um, so it's a machine learning photometric classifier for massive stars in nearby galaxies. I'll just uh, quickly describe what we did. So we compiled a large catalog of known massive stars in M31 and M33 to use that as a training sample to the classifier. We grouped these known massive stars in seven classes. So blue supergiants, red supergiants, yellow supergiants. Then B, brackety supergiants were separate. Luminous variables were separate. Both for yes stars were separate. And then we had some outliers like quasars and background galaxies. So we built uh, an ensemble classifier using uh, this training set, using color indices as features and uh, combine the probabilities from three machine learning algorithms, support vector classification, random forest neural networks. Uh, and we found an overall performance of the classifier to be 86%, which, were, which we were very pleased about. Of course, that varies according to the class. And this is for these galaxies, M31, M33. Once we uh, used the, the classifier that had been trained on M31 and M33 and applied it independently, to other galaxies, such as IC1613, WLM, and Sextance A, we obtained an overall accuracy of 75%, so a bit lower, but still quite satisfactory. So we are uh, in the process now of applying this algorithm to the data from 25 galaxies, which we have assembled, to select the dusty luminous massive stars and obtain spectra for them. Now here's a table um, showing some of our data that we have obtained with VLT Forge 2. It's a work in preparation by Frank Tramper. Just I want you, want you to notice the distances. So we're ranging from one megaparsec to almost five megaparsecs. We span a metallicity range um, <clears throat> from 0 0.06 to about 2.2. And this is only a small fraction of the galaxies, actually. Um, here is a table showing the photometry that we have for these galaxies. So there's a lot of Spitzer photometry and this is actually how we selected the galaxies. We needed them to have Spitzer photometry available. We complemented that with Gaia, Pan stars, Vista Hemisphere survey uh, photometry as well. We carefully removed foreground sources and uh, applied for time and we, for force two. Actually, I'm showing a uh, um, CMD for NGC 55, one of the galaxies, showing you the various uh, objects that we have uh, in the CMD. These are based on various priorities that we have set, and the ones with black circles are the ones that uh, are in the slit. Eta Kari is shown here for comparison. Uh, due to various constraints with the slits, we're not able to get all of them, but we did our best to uh, put the most interesting ones in there. Here is the pre-imaging image uh, showing here on the right, the high priority targets in red and some slits that are covering other stars just to fill the other stars that we use to cover the slits in Forest 2. Um, some of our observations were obtained, although the, we were scheduled to get observations starting in March, 2020, which as we know, the pandemic struck and fortunately we were able to still get some of the data, although not all of it. 
so I have something to show. Um, here are some of the data obtained um, later that year in 2020. We have two blue sources. Uh, one has strong H alpha emission and one red supergiant showing the molecular bands here that are uh, representative of these type of sources. Actually, this is just shifted down the original flux calibrated spectrum is in gray and it's shifted down so for clarity. So we have, it seems that our selection criteria are finding uh, <clears throat> sources we are, we were expecting. I uh, also wanted to show you a couple of slides from the work of Stefan De Witt. <coughs> he has involved massive stars in the magic line of clouds that he's focusing on. We obtained a uh, spectrum from Magellan Mage uh, between November 2019 and March 2020, and he's been working on these. And uh, the paper is almost ready to be submitted. One of them turned out to be a giant, but the rest are all supergiants, as you can see here in the spectral types that he has found. Uh, here is um, part of the spectrum showing the calcium triplet, which is a luminosity indicator for red supergiants. Um, you can see the third one from the bottom is the giant, which does not have deep calcium two lines, but all the others do. And that's uh, very encouraging. And that actually helps the, the, the spectral classification. Here's a preliminary table with the results so far. Some error bars are missing, but you can see the radii of the stars, the initial masses, uh, luminosities, um, et cetera, for, for these stars. So stay tuned for this paper. Um, so coming to the summary now conclusions, uh, I hope I've shown you and convinced you that constraining massive star evolution requires further observational constraints uh, in various um, aspects we need for various parameters. We need accurate masses, abundances, mass loss measurements for large samples of stars, which are not very easy to obtain. We hope that our classifier will help people um, obtain um, samples and be able to focus on specific types of stars more efficiently. Another point I want to make is that evident to leave you with rather is that there's evidence for episodic mass loss and that's ubiquitous from supernovae and shells around evolved massive stars. Uh, the mid infrared selection technique seems to be successful in identifying dusty evolved massive stars and our ERC funded assess project is an ambitious survey of a thousand evolved massive stars to determine the role of episodic mass loss in the evolution of the most massive stars. Stay, stay tuned please for our results. Uh, so I just wanna thank you again and I'll take questions.